Dear Hannes, let me start by saying once again, belated happy birthday. I wish you good luck, good health, and lots of continuing good humor. And it's been a pleasure having you in the platform of European Memory and Conscience, where you started off as our digital online librarian, suggesting dozens of titles of literature and films dealing with Nazism and communism. So thank you very much for being with us in the platform. I was asked to talk about totalitarianism in Europe, Nazism and communism, or communism and Nazism, and the platform of European memory and conscience. The 20th century was a century of unprecedented violence and trauma. Europeans unleashed two world wars and created totalitarian systems of rule which brought about immense human suffering, destruction, and traumatization for generations to come. Science now knows that trauma is passed on to our children in an epigenetic way. And post-totalitarian societies need to deal with the past so that they can heal from the trauma and be able to move on to deal with the present. From this perspective, the Platform of European Memory and Conscience is an organization whose aim it is to help to heal totalitarian trauma on the international level. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what young Hitler, Stalin, and Mao all had in common? They had very violent fathers. They were born after two of their older siblings died in infancy, and they had religious mothers who doted on them and could not protect them against the familial abuse. These men received serious childhood trauma, which robbed them of the ability to feel for other human beings, of empathy and humanness. They proceeded to become the greatest mega murderers in human history, each being responsible for tens of millions of deaths. The road to totalitarianism was paved during World War I, which was the first modern industrial war. New technology enabled the dehumanization and killing of killing, and people were annihilated in masses. And so, not surprisingly, mass ideologies based on the dehumanization of people came to power at this time, developed by Hitler, Stalin, and people of their kind with low or no empathy for fellow human beings. Communism took hold in Russia with the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, and Nazism rose in post-World War I Germany. Communists and Nazis alike soon seized total control of the state, declaring large groups of people their enemies, persecuting and annihilating them. Hitler and Stalin signed their infamous Cooperation Pact of 1939, and together they launched another, even deadlier, World War II. The madness of killing and destruction ended in 1945 with Nazism defeated by military force. The International Nuremberg Tribunal sentenced the main Nazi war cri criminals, but communism, however, the deadlier and more tricky of the two totalitarian systems, turned on its earlier ally and survived. It became responsible for a staggering total of about 100 million deaths worldwide. In October 1945, the United Nations were established with the goal of preventing future wars. However, when the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in December 1948, Communist Soviet Union and the countries which it had so-called liberated or occupied at the end of World War II abstained from voting. Hidden behind the Iron Curtain, Communism kept violating every single article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, killing, deporting, enslaving, imprisoning, and persecuting its citizens until 1989-1991, when the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union disintegrated and the Soviet troops were withdrawn from the region. And so, following World War II, Two more generations grew up in communism, traumatized by the effects of two succeeding totalitarianisms. The fall of communism was, in most cases, a negotiated handover of power. As a result, no immediate and comprehensive truth, justice, and reconciliation process took place. The vast majority of communist perpetrators got away with their crimes. 
which caused disillusion and a division in post-communist societies, which can be seen until today. The new leaders of the time, such as Václav Klaus in the Czech Republic, Vladimir Mečiar in Slovakia, or Tadeusz Mazowiecki in Poland, insisted on drawing a thick line behind the past. But as former German president Joachim Gauck says, thick lines behind the past, they do not hold. Sooner or later, they give way. And so the slow and, and difficult process of healing in Central and Eastern Europe began, very often driven by persistent efforts from former dissidents and victims associations. Laws on rehabilitation, compensation, property restitution, and vetting of persons for public office were adopted. National memory institutions were established, and archives of the totalitarian secret services were opened to the public. Successful films appeared dealing with the totalitarian history. In German, the process is called Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, or in English, coming to terms with the past. In June 2008, while I was working for former student leader of the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, Martin Meistrik, who was then senator of the parliament of the Czech Republic, we organized a conference called European Conscience and Communism. On the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Iron Curtain, we felt that dealing with the communist past needed to become a European issue, not only one of Central and Eastern Europe. We invited Václav Havel, Joachim Gauck, as well as former anti-communist opposition leaders from the Baltics, Vitautas Landsbergis, Sandra Kalnete, Tune Kelam, and Laszlo Tökes from Romania, as well as many other renowned guests and leaders from, from Europe. At the conference, we adopted the Prague Declaration on European Conscience and Communism, which contains a roadmap of 19 points needed to reach a European coming to terms with communism. One of these points was the establishment of an Institute of European Memory and Conscience. And the Czech presidency of the Council of the European Union in 2009 raised this issue. The European Parliament adopted its historical re resolution on European conscience and totalitarianism in April 2009, in which, for the first time, Nazism and communism are mentioned in one sentence, side by side, and in which the creation of a platform of European memory and conscience is called for. After three years of preparatory work, the platform was then established in October 2011 in Prague, by 20 founding memory institutions and organizations from 12 EU member states. The platform membership has been growing since then continuously. It includes Hannes's research institution at the University of Iceland, and today it has, a, a twin, uh, it has today 70 members from 23 countries of Europe and North America. The platform creates international projects in English aimed at awareness raising, education, research, commemoration, and international justice. We started by producing an international traveling exhibition called Totalitarianism in Europe, Nazism, Fascism, and Communism, which presents the numbers of civilian victims of these regimes from 14 European countries. The exhibition has been presented in 21 countries of Europe and North America so far. Here, I'm just showing you the catalog of the exhibition, if you're interested. Um, the next project was a reader for secondary school students anywhere in Europe called Lest We Forget Memory of Totalitarianism in Europe, which is now out in its second edition and in 11 languages. We also developed an educational board game called Across the Iron Curtain, which has been published in four language versions and in which players are helping refugees whose short stories are inspired by real cases to escape from the Eastern Bloc into the democratic West. As another milestone in its work, the platform held an international competition for a pan-European memorial to the victims of all totalitarian regimes, which is to be located in the heart of the European district in Brussels. And the platform is now raising support for the construction of the winning entry, which is depicted for those who are interested, in the booklet here. It's a very beautiful one, by the way, by a British architect. Um, beside organizing international conferences and commemorative and other events, the platform also awards its annual prize, 
which is dedicated to persons fighting totalitarianism anywhere in the world today. The laureates include Crimean Tatar leader Mustafa Jemilev, the Navalny brothers, Ukrainian film director Oleg Sensov, Belarusian leader Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, or the International Memorial Organization. And finally, a very important part of the work of the platform is the Justice 2.0 project. We are trying to reach justice for at least some of the worst crimes of communism, which are not subject to statutory limitations, by involving the judiciary from other countries. Symbolically, we chose the killings of unarmed refugees on the Iron Curtain in former Czechoslovakia. We gathered thousands of pages of archival documents and filed criminal complaints in Poland, Germany, and the Czech Republic against the entire chain of command of perpetrators, including the surviving members of the communist leadership of Czechoslovakia. After several years, I'm very pleased to be able to announce that we have a breakthrough. The first trial against a former Minister of Interior opened in Prague at the end of April. Five of his six victims are German and one is Czech. The verdict is expected on the 15th of August this year. Somewhere down the lines, we hope that based on such and similar trials of communist functionaries, we will be able to finally achieve an international condemnation of communism, similarly as it happened for Nazism after World War II. And it is my hope that the platform of European memory and conscience, which has never had it easy to find funding, can continue its important work, creating good quality projects and helping European society to heal from 20th century trauma for many years to come. We must not allow totalitarian history to be forgotten. As they say, those who forget their past are condemned to repeat it. We also know that unhealed victims of abuse can turn into terrible perpetrators. How dangerous the lack of healing of totalitarian trauma and the falsification of history can be is demonstrated today in a horrifying way by Putin's Russia and its military aggression against Ukraine. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.